right hand and repeat after me. I hereby declare an oath. I hereby declare an oath. That I absolutely and entirely. That I absolutely and entirely. Renounce and abjure. Renounce and abjure. All allegiance and fidelity. All allegiance and fidelity. To any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty. To any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty. Of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or a citizen. Of which I have heretofore been a subject or a citizen. That I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. That I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law. That I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law. That I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by the law. That I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by the law. And that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. And that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. So help me God. So help me God. What did I just do? What was that? I just swore the same oath that naturalized immigrants declare when they become citizens of the United States. If that seemed a little bit uncomfortable or unnatural to you, it's worth asking why. What is it about that language of obligations and service that seems so foreign to us? Over the course of the last year or two, I've been on a journey across this country in search of the meaning of our citizenship. My travels have taken me from California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, from precincts of great privation to temples of great power, in the company of soldiers and artists and preachers and strivers of every stripe. And what I have learned is this. Our citizenship is an utter contradiction. It is a concept created by people who renounce their prior citizenship and their prior loyalties, and yet it demands and commands our loyalty. It is central to our Constitution and to our scheme of laws. And yet nowhere in our Constitution or our laws is it ever affirmatively defined. Citizenship counts. We know it matters. There is a status, but we don't know what that status contains or who gets to claim it. The beauty and the power of citizenship is that for all of us, we make it by seeking it out. We define it by being perpetually in search of it. As in any migration, whether of an American new to these shores or an American newly awake. There's typically an arc to that journey. It begins with a dream, a dream of what we can be. From that dream comes the thrill and then the shock of arrival. Inevitably, though, what follows after that is betrayal of the dream and of its promise. And then eventually, belatedly, even if partially, comes redemption, the dream at least somewhat fulfilled. And it is that possibility, that glimpse of the possibility of redemption that reanimates for another generation the meaning, the content, and the obligations of the dream. These are the elements of our journey. Dream, arrival, betrayal, redemption, dream. The American dream. Is there a more cliché cliché? And yet, and yet, the idea still compels. In a land that does not have common blood or tribe or stories of swords being pulled out of stones to bind us together and enshroud our creation in the mist of myth, all we have to bind us together is a dream, a dream of being American, which is to say, a dream of freedom and belonging. Dreams animate our waking lives as Americans whether we are immigrants or native-born, whether we are first, second, tenth generation. When I was a boy, I dreamed of somebody, of being somebody. I looked up to somebody, literally. High up on the shelf of my family's study, nestled between two marble bookends, was a sober black and white photograph of an officer in the Chinese Nationalist Air Force. He was a general. He was my father's father. I never knew my grandfather except through his serious face in that photograph and others. But here's what I did know about him. He had been born the son of a farmer. He managed to go to a military academy in China. He became a pilot. 
He ended up fighting first against the Japanese and later against the Communist Chinese. His name was Liu Guoyun. Liu, my family name, Guoyun, meaning deliverance of the nation. No pressure. <laughs> when I was a boy, I dreamed of delivering a nation, but I didn't really ask which nation. I knew that I was Chinese and I was American, but I did not yet know that these two things were not the same. With stories of my grandfather forming and filling my imagination, I dreamed of being a pilot, being a flying tiger, being a black sheep, fighting the Pacific War. I dreamed of being in my own blue Corsair fighter, fighter plane. I dreamed of fighting the Japanese. I dreamed of <coughs> shooting down Japanese zeroes over the Pacific. I dreamed of killing Japs. I dreamed of painting little Japanese flags on the side of my Corsair every time I killed a Jap. In this way, I could imagine that my family history and my desire to claim this country were one and the same. I could imagine that to be Chinese and to be American was to have the same goal, the same identity, because we had the same enemy. It wasn't until many years later when I learned about how after Pearl Harbor, some Chinese Americans took nervously to wearing buttons that said, Chinese, not Japanese, that I realized just how ridiculous, absurd my youthful self-concept had been. I thought of myself as a child as the good Asian, the loyal Asian. But at the time, it didn't seem cringeworthy. It seemed positively providential that I should be both Chinese and American. Around the very time that the Pacific War was unfolding, a young teenager named Gerda Weissman was being delivered from her hometown in Poland via the trains of the Third Reich to a labor camp in Czechoslovakia. Her parents had already been delivered to Auschwitz. And Gerda survived the unspeakable extremities and horrors of the Holocaust by honing and holding on to a simple dream. She imagined what life beyond the camps would be. She dreamed of a simple life where she might have dinner parties, where her biggest decisions would be whether to wear the blue dress or the red dress. And she nurtured those dreams into something hard and real and vivid that could nurture her. When Gerda Weissman was liberated at war's end, she weighed 68 pounds. Her hair had turned completely white. She had not had a bath in three years. She was liberated by an American GI named Kurt Klein. Kurt Klein had been born in Germany, a Jew, and had fled Germany as the Nazis came to power. His parents, too, had been sent to Auschwitz, never to be heard from again. And when Kurt liberated Gerda, he restored her to humanity by a simple gesture. He held a door open for her. Well, Gerda Weissman would come to marry that GI who liberated her and become Gerda Weissman Klein. She would move with him to the United States and she would begin a life that was both extraordinary and beautifully ordinary. Gerda wrote a memoir of her life and her years in the camps called All But My Life, which became an international bestseller. Documentaries were made about her. Well into senior citizenship, she formed an organization called Citizenship Counts, teaching young people about the meaning and the power and the value of our citizenship. On the other hand, as Gerda herself says, she wasn't Mother Teresa. She didn't cure cancer. All she did was enjoy the simple freedom of living life as a mother, a wife, a grandmother, and to build friendships that would become like family to her. Gerda Weissman Klein and I today are like family. She is magical, and there's a palpable magic to her eyes and her heart. And I suppose she's drawn to my earnestness. And though we speak very different idioms across very different generations, we are fundamentally asking the same kinds of questions. What does it mean to be an American? Citizenship counts, but what counts as citizenship? Our citizenship is itself a dream, vague and aspirational and yet, yet still irresistible, inspiring, and as real as any other idea that forms and shapes our sense of the possible. I dream of Dred Scott. I dream of Martin Luther King. I dream of the Manzanar internment camps. I dream of Martin Luther King. I dream of all of these voices and faces in American life and American history. And here's the simple question. What is it 
that binds us together? What is it that unites us, that can bring all of these disparate people, my grandfather, my adopted grandmother, which is what Gerda Weissman Klein calls herself, you, me, millions of unseen others, what is it that makes us one family? Only a dream of surpassing ambition. We will now begin your history and civics test. Due to the size of our group, please indicate your desire to answer on behalf of the group by raising your hand. Under some circumstances, you will be asked to discuss questions with those seated around you. This is also a test of your ability to speak English. Please adhere to time guidelines given by this timing device and myself. Question one, who was the first president? You can raise your hand. In the back? Thank you, that is correct. Uh, what is one right or freedom from the First Amendment? Yes, please. That is an allowable answer, thank you. <laughs> Please discuss the following question with those around you. What is the rule of law? You may begin. Julia Liu arrived in the United States. She was 21 years old. She spoke pretty little English. She had almost no money, a small sack of clothes. When her cargo ship pulled up at Baltimore Port, there was no one there to greet her. And the scene at the port was utterly bewildering, the chatter all around her practically unintelligible. But by her own wits and determination, she made her way. She found work, and one job led to another, and soon she had saved enough money to go to college. Now, here's what I didn't tell you. My mother was already a college graduate. She had gone to Taiwan University, where her father had been a professor of European history. She didn't have any money because on a port call in Tokyo en route, she had decided to spend all her money buying an expensive camera on the idea that she would sell it for a profit here. <laughs> and though nobody was there to greet her at the port, she was soon picked up by friends of the family, former students of her father, who took her in help clear her path at every turn. When my mother first started working, one of her earliest jobs was as a file clerk at a Manhattan-based coffee company called Chock Full of Nuts. My mother was shy, quiet, kept to herself, but she was very responsible. And there was a kindly executive there, an older black man named Mr. Robinson, who took an interest in her, looked out for her. He and his secretary made sure that no one was picking on her, made sure that she got important jobs, like passing out the paychecks every other week. And every time she saw Mr. Robinson in the elevator, he had a kind word for her. He asked how she was doing. Well, it wasn't until years later, long after she'd left that company, that she learned that Mr. Robinson had been an ex-ball player. And his name was Jackie. So which is it? Scared, lonely, young immigrant women, woman? Destined for the margins? Or proud new American? touched by a mythic American, destined to claim this country as her own. Arrival stories can be told many, many ways. When I was about the age my mom had been when she came to the United States, I had my own form of arrival. I stepped off a bus one humid summer night in rural Virginia, and as soon as my feet hit the ground, I was besieged, accosted by large, burly men pushing me, shoving me, yelling at me. My small sack of clothes disappeared from my hands. I was spun around. I didn't know what was going on. It was terrifying, but I was arriving quite voluntarily into the United States Marine Corps. For 12 weeks, after the summers of my sophomore and junior years of college, 
I joined Officer Candidate School. At Marine Corps OCS, I was acculturated to a tradition, an Anglo-American naval lexicon and way of thinking, in which arrival at the base itself was called disembarkation. Doors were called hatches and windows portholes. The right side was starboard. The Marine Corps itself was called the Fleet Marine Force. There was something absolutely gripping about my arrival into the Marine Corps. Those, those weeks marked a passage for me, a chance to fuse my family heritage with the claiming of this country. Plus, I had a little something to prove. I was a little guy, an Asian guy, an Ivy League guy with glasses. In fact, for the first few weeks, that was my name, Glasses. As in, Glasses, get over here! Glasses, what the hell are you doing? Glasses, get over here! And as harrowing as it was in the beginning, though, as absolutely bewildering and disorienting as it was, I came to love my time there. And it wasn't long before I realized I belonged. I remember one afternoon toward the end of my first summer at OCS, I was walking across the parade deck on my way back to the barracks. I was alone, not in formation, but I still kept a very crisp marine bearing as I walked. And all of a sudden, mid-stride, someone yelled out for me from across the way at me. General Lou! I turned around. It was two of the drill instructors standing there slapping their knees and laughing at me. <laughs> One of them said, look at him go! Boy, thinks he's a general already! I paused and wasn't sure what to do, but then I realized this was the kind of ribbing that you would call good nature. And so I just decided to nod and keep on going. I realized at that moment that I had made it, that I had claimed this place. General Lou, I like the sound of that. <laughs> now, not all arrival stories are so triumphal or self-satisfied. This is what a fellow named Mark Massey, a white evangelical Christian in Oklahoma, would come to learn. Mark was a lay minister at a roadside Pentecostal church in Tulsa. And one day, during services, he saw two brown-skinned men enter the back of the church, scared, hunched, unsure of what they were doing. They sat down in the rear pews. As soon as services were over, Mark went over to them. These two men had traveled from across the road from the factory that was there called the Pickle Steel Company. Before that, they had traveled half a world. They and many others had been brought over to the United States from India to be so-called guest workers. They'd been promised good jobs, good wages, a chance to send money back home. What they got was something altogether different. And as Mark Massey began to listen to them tell their stories of arrival, he began to realize that he, too, was about to embark on a journey. Well, as it turned out, I didn't go into the Marine Corps. I declined my second lieutenant's commission when I graduated from college, and I decided instead to go into government. My first job was working for a United States senator named David Boren, Democrat of Oklahoma. Working for David Boren in the United States Senate, I came to revere the traditions of the Senate. I came to love our Constitution. I came to revere the 14th Amendment and its promise of equal protection of the laws. I also came to know almost every corner of the Sooner State. I came to know Seminole, Oklahoma City, and Lawton, and all different places, including Tulsa. In fact, moving around Tulsa like some young big shot, very conscious of how much I stood out in this white prairie land, and yet still secure in the status that my boss conferred upon me, it's quite possible I drove right past that roadside church in that factory. It's quite possible that I went right down that road without seeing the worlds on either side of me. Question four. Who lived in America before the Europeans arrived? Yes, please. Thank you, that is correct. Question five. Where is the Statue of Liberty? Thank you. New York Harbor. That's correct. Please discuss the following question with those around you. Name one right that is only for United States citizens. You may begin.
late 1990s now, about 40 years since my mother first arrived in the United States, about 20 years after she's been naturalized as a U.S. citizen, and about six or seven years since my father's death. My mother has painstakingly reconstructed her life in widowhood. She's managed to convert a mid-level job at a small company into an opportunity to do international business development in China. But in order to do this job, because it involves a federal contract, she has to get a security clearance. She has to take a polygraph. <laughs> My mother is earnest, utterly without pretense or guile. She fails the polygraph. She fails it a second time. Now she starts to get nervous and anxious. She fails it a third time. Her blood pressure goes up. She can't sleep. This was 15 years ago. Her blood pressure has never quite gone down. Eventually, finally, she passes the polygraph. She gets the security clearances, and she's allowed to do this work. But I, for one, never forgot the anxiety of that period. Maybe one of the reasons why is, about that same time, another Chinese-American of her generation also failed a polygraph. His name was Wen Ho Lee. Wen Ho Lee was a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratories, a federal nuclear weapons research facility. Wen Ho Lee was a quiet guy, a little quirky, kept to himself. And somebody got it in their head when the Chinese suddenly made great advances in their nuclear weaponry that Wen Ho Lee must have been passing secrets to the Chinese. And so he suddenly found himself accused by his co-workers, by his countrymen, by his government, accused of being a spy. He was charged. He was detained. He was held in solitary confinement in shackles for over a year. One of the most remarkable things about Wen Ho Lee is that during that period, very few people spoke out for him. I remember being told once by Norm Minetta, the former U.S. Commerce Secretary under Presidents Clinton and President Bush, about the experience he had and the forms he had to fill out, fill out when he was rounded up for the internment camps after Pearl Harbor. He was sent to the camps, and there was a form there, and it gave him two choices on that form. Alien or non-alien. And Norm looked at that form, and he said to the person, non-alien, what's that? Isn't that supposed to say citizen? In times of doubt and fear and anxiety, some citizens can slip into this shadowy, murkier category called non-alien, and from there slip further into a category simply called other. That's what Wen Ho Lee discovered as he stood accused and found his name, his reputation, his career ruined by a two-year witch hunt that unfolded not only in the criminal justice system, but in the national media. One of the things that Wen Ho Lee did at that time was to ask for help. The power and the beauty of what happened then reminds me of a thing that happened long, long before that. Wen Ho Lee's experience was nothing at all like my mother's experience. She failed her polygraph, yes, but her experience had nothing to do with espionage. And as traumatic as it was for me to watch her fail those exams, it wasn't anything like what Wen Ho Lee had to experience. But what it did teach me and remind me of was this, that perhaps still in America at this time, someone with the face and the voice and the accent of my mother might always be presumed foreign until proven otherwise. Yes, she was no longer quite Chinese, but not yet fully American either. In between, perpetual. That space between can be killing. In the cold waters off San Francisco, not far from Alcatraz, lies another small outcropping of rock called Angel Island. Angel Island is the negative of Ellis Island. On that little rock was built a clapboard prison meant to execute a policy of Chinese exclusion. You see, in 1882, the United States Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, marking decades, culminating, the culmination of decades of anti-Chinese violence, both legal and physical. Riots, roundups, racist ordinances, all fueled by white resentment of the cheap Chinese labor that had been brought here to mine our mountains and to lay our railroads. The Chinese Exclusion Act was remarkable. It marked the first time in our country's history that we had banned an entire group by race 
not only from citizenship, but, but from entering our territory. Now, no, I said we. We had banned. To which you might rightly ask, who's we, Kimasabi? I do that a lot. I say we, we Americans. We Americans won the Battle of Normandy. We Americans built the great mass middle class in the post-war years. We Americans sent a man to the moon. But we cuts both ways, doesn't it? We enslaved Africans. We besieged and beheaded tribe after tribe of Native Americans. We rounded up our Japanese-American neighbors into internment camps. We excluded the Chinese, which is to say, we excluded me. We hated me. We blamed me for all of our troubles during that period of dislocation and unrest and labor turmoil. For two generations after the enactment of Chinese exclusion, any Chinese national wishing to disembark San Francisco was brought to Angel Island, detained, subjected to often bizarre, long interrogations, and eventually deported. But they would sometimes languish there on Angel Island for weeks, months, sometimes even years. And into the walls of that prison compound, those earnest Chinese immigrants began to carve Chinese characters, crude classical poetry, trying to express their lamentation and their sense of loss and limbo. Imagine, imagine trying to express that kind of pain and not being sure whether it would be lost forever in translation. That's what those two men at Mark Massey's roadside church were going through. They had been brought to the United States by John Nash Pickle, owner of the Pickle Steel Company. Pickle had gone over to India to hand-select each one of them. They were skilled workers, all of them. Some of them had been educated. He promised them good wages, health insurance, a chance to get a green card, to bring their families over. But instead, after their long journey when they arrived in Oklahoma, they were greeted simply by Pickle's wife, who promptly took away their passports. Those men soon realized they weren't going to get those passports back. And they weren't going to get much of anything they'd been promised. What they were going to get was essentially indentured servitude. And so those two would come across the way to Mark Massey's church, across a great gulf of imagining, were risking not just their livelihoods, but their lives. Like their 19th century brethren on Angel Island, they were stuck not just in legal limbo, but stuck seemingly in time. Around that very time, in another America altogether different, a woman named Antonella Packer was discovering the meaning of being caught in the middle like that. Antonella Packard was a poster child for a new Republican Party. She was a Republican, Mormon, Hispanic, immigrant, small businesswoman in Salt Lake City, active in the state GOP, a true believer. Well, one day, Antonella heard about some young people, activists, immigrants, some of them undocumented, who had staged a sit-in at the Salt Lake office of Senator Orrin Hatch. They were dreamers, activists trying to create the DREAM Act that would allow undocumented people to find a pathway to citizenship through service in the military or through higher education. And they were there staging their sit-in to pressure Senator Hatch to support the DREAM Act. Well, the office and the police responded with overwhelming force. Cops in riot gear showed up. They hustled the kids out, they shoved them around, Several of them were, de were detained without charges. And as Antonella Packard learned about this, she was troubled. No, she was more than troubled. She was mad. She thought to herself, this is un-American. This is not what's supposed to happen in the United States. And so she began to speak out on behalf of those kids and against Senator Hatch. And she began to pay a price. At first, party leaders told her to pipe down, stop meeting with those kids but she didn't listen to them. So she found herself quietly removed from party leadership roles. Then she found that business at her small consulting firm was drying up for no good reason. And then began the prank calls, relentless calls, referring to Antonella sneeringly by her maiden name, Antonella Romero, in, out, just that fast. Question seven, name one problem that led to the Civil War. 
Slavery? Thank you, that is an allowable answer. <laughs> Please discuss the following question with those around you. What do we show loyalty to when we say the Pledge of Allegiance? You may begin. Constitution Week in September in Philadelphia. I'm in a great vaulting glass and steel building called the National Constitution Center. Sitting next to me is Benjamin Franklin getting ready to make a speech. Thomas Jefferson's somewhere around here, I just saw him. And when I look out the window, I see a parade of dozens of men in Revolutionary Era garb flying the colors of various militias and colonies. And they're marching from Independence Hall across the mall to the Constitution Center. They are sons of the American Revolution, each man a lineal descendant of the founding generation. And we're all gathered here to celebrate the 225th birthday of the Constitution. As the sons stream into the hall, many of them with their spouses, who are daughters of the American Revolution, it becomes very clear that these folks have a routine for events like this. They have a ritual, a tradition. They have no idea that in a few minutes some Chinese guy is going to lead them in a ceremony they didn't ask for and they're not sure whether to like. You see, to the sons and daughters of the American Revolution, American citizenship is something like a birthright. But what few people know is that it actually took a Chinaman to make citizenship an actual birthright in the United States. In 1890, eight years after the enactment of Chinese exclusion, a cook from San Francisco named Wong Kim Ark went to China to visit relatives. Upon his return, he was denied re-entry into the United States on the notion that he was a Chinese subject to exclusion. He argued, or rather, the white lawyers who took up his cause argued, that the language of the 14th Amendment was plain. All persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States. Wong Kim Ark's parents had been born in China, and yes, it was true that the Chinese Exclusion Act barred more Chinese nationals from coming in, but he had been born here. And so, as his case made, his way, made its way up to the federal, through the federal courts, he made this simple argument. And ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court found, too, that the language of the 14th Amendment was immovable and ruled in his favor. The court did not do so out of any love of the Chinese. But they simply recognized that to read the amendment against the Chinese would be, in the words of Justice Horace Gray, to deny citizenship to thousands of persons of English, Scotch, Irish, and German descent who have always been treated and considered, as considered citizens. And that wouldn't do. And so in the landmark case of Wang Kim Ark versus the United States, the race blind principle of birthright citizenship in the United States was established. And it happened because a Chinese man exercised his right to seek a remedy in the court of law. It happened because he decided to test whether this was indeed a nation of its word. In Los Alamos, New Mexico, Wen Ho Lee, the accused spy, also fought the system. He had a whole army of lawyers and activists and journalists helping him, fighting his charges, making his case known to the country. And ultimately, all of the dozens of charges that were filed against them, all but one, was dropped. He pled guilty to a simple charge of having mishandled classified documents. He was exonerated from charges of espionage and all the other things that had been said about him. But this news received only a whisper of attention in the media compared to the screams and shouts of disloyalty that had introduced him to his countrymen. Win Ho Lee never received anything like an apology from his persecutors in the administration, for the national media. The closest thing he got 
came from Judge James A. Parker, District Court Judge of the United States District Court of New Mexico, who in the final disposition, in the final hearing of his case, said to Wen Ho Lee this, Dr. Lee, you and I are both citizens of the United States, but there is a difference between us. You had to study the Constitution in order to become a citizen. Many of us here are citizens by the simple serendipitous fact of our birth here. And so what I'm about to tell you, you probably already know from having studied it, but I'll explain it to you anyway. And Judge Parker went on to explain all the reasons, legal, moral, ethical, why his detention, his treatment, his persecution by the government had been not just unjust, unlawful, unconstitutional, un-American, but in the judge's words, saddening. And on behalf of the United States judiciary system, the judge apologized. While Mark Massey, back in Oklahoma, wasn't even thinking about apologies or the rule of law, he found himself face to face with these two men, these guest workers, and he realized now he had a choice to make. And he made it. He decided he was going to help them. At first, he went to the police in Tulsa, but he quickly realized that the police were in cahoots with the factory owner. And so then he realized he had to find another way around. He did the simplest thing he could. He gave them refuge. He allowed these two men who had come to him to stay with him. And over the next few days and weeks, he began to sneak out two and four and ten and all of those 50-plus guest workers at that factory, sneaking them through in his van to a barn on his property. He then found out about another factory in Louisiana where Indian guest workers were being exploited. He got in his van and he drove down there to help them too. There too, he tried to first enlist to help the authorities and there too, the cops were corrupt. He spent a night in jail for trespassing. When Mark Massey got out of jail, he was liberated. He was without doubt, without fear. And whereas before, when he first had encountered those men at that church, he had been frightened and unsure whether he was acting within the ambit of the law, whether the law was within the ambit of morality, whether the facade of everyday life in Tulsa was just that, a facade, masking who knows what kind of exploitation and injustice. Now, coming out of jail himself, he had no fear. He began to organize and mobilize. He began to work with activists and lawyers for these and other indentured workers. He emboldened the workers to file suit, federal racketeering charges against their employers. And the indentures were punished. Now, a good Samaritan is somebody who helps out somebody he comes upon. This was more than good Samaritanship. This was full-on, full-body citizenship, risking life and limb, not only to help another, but to help sustain a picture of what a community is supposed to be. But ask Mark Massey, and he won't put it in those terms. Mark is as humble and quiet a man as you'll meet. His Oklahoma accent, as American a sound as you'll hear. And to Mark, this wasn't heroism or civic duty. It was just simply the call of conscience. Conscience is also what kept Antonella Packard grounded. She began to find herself stumbling accidentally into the role of an accidental activist for immigrant rights. She too had made a choice, and she decided she needed to speak out. She became the first organizer in the state of Utah of the League of United Latin American Citizens. She began to work in close quarters with activists for immigrant rights. And yet she still remained active as a Republican, even though some of her fellow conservatives mistrusted her, thought her disloyal. Antonella Packard described herself as a God-fearing, constitution-loving, free market conservative, a true Republican. And in her mind, she had kept the faith to her party, to her country, to her basic sense of Christian decency. And so for her, coming through those trials and tribulations of exclusion and ostracization, she was clear as could be that she was not going to let anybody else define for her the right way to be a conservative or a right-thinking American. Antonella Packard has never met Gerda Weissman Klein, the indomitable Holocaust survivor, who even today, well into her 80s, still travels all around the United States leading naturalization ceremonies and speaking about the meaning of citizenship. But Antonella's decision to find and to keep her voice, even if it meant standing apart from others, reminded me of a story Gerda once told me about a dinner party 
she attended not long after coming to the United States. At this dinner party, one of the guests began very rapidly to excoriate President Truman, saying the guy was running the country into the ground, and he was all messed up, and everything was wrong, and this was bad. Gerda nervously clutched Kurt's arm. She whispered to him, is this okay? Aren't we going to get in trouble for being here? Aren't we guilty by association of this? Well, as it turned out, that dinner guest had just been putting on a show to teach Gerda, their new American friend, the meaning of freedom of speech and the purpose of dissent. It was a lesson Gerda never forgot. When is dissent loyalty? What is freedom for? These are the kinds of questions that animate the conscience of an American. This is your final question. Please discuss this question with those around you. What is one responsibility that is only for United States citizens? You may begin. been very big into genealogy. Partly it's because my own family history can't be traced too far beyond three generations. My parents emigrated here from China via Taiwan. Their parents moved all across a war-torn China. Their parents before them, my great-grandparents, I know almost nothing about. Beyond them, the thread disappears entirely. This is not an uncommon experience for many immigrant families, the sense that your own history is obscured from view. And yet it is strange to feel so afloat in history. Maybe that's why, from the time I was a kid, I've always glommed onto great traditions and lineages, real and imagined. When I was a kid, it was the lineages of Star Trek and Starfleet and USS Enterprise. As I became older, it was the traditions of the United States Marine Corps. But no tradition have I ever grabbed onto more powerfully and with more commitment than, that's, than that simply of the United States as a singular nation, indivisible? A tradition that I've wanted not only to claim but to reclaim, and by inserting myself into it, to remake it. My mother, in her own small ways, shows me how. In her life as a widow, she has become not simply a self-actualized person, but a fully self-empowered citizen. She spends hours every day poring over the Washington Post. She follows politics and public affairs with a passion. She's Charlie Rose's biggest fan. She's a choosy independent. She votes in every election. But not just that. She joins. She joins her alumni association. She joins her homeowners group. She joins various other associations. She shows up. She claims it. She mentors young people. My mother earns her citizenship. Which raises the question, what if citizenship was not a birthright for any of us? What if we all had to earn it? What if it took being a contributor to community, a catalyst for justice, some force of contribution to the world in order to claim the title citizen? Because all around us are citizens who don't live like citizens and non-citizens who do. I was in Philadelphia with these sons and daughters of the American Revolution on the 225th birthday of the Constitution. Now, to be a son or daughter of the American Revolution requires some serious genealogy. It also requires some serious revolutionary era wardrobe. <laughs> but most of all, it requires a serious, passionate commitment to extending the line, to preserving history by embodying it, reenacting it. I had come to Philadelphia to lead something called a sworn again America ceremony. Naturalizing immigrants, when they become citizens, have to go through a whole process. They have to swear an oath, they have to take a test, 
They hear words of civic scripture. I had come here because a group of us had decided, what if we created something like that for all Americans? Not just new immigrants, but long-standing Americans as well. A chance for us to renew our vows, to reclaim a commitment to this country, to become sworn again. That ceremony, that ritual, that oath, begins with a simple promise that we make to ourselves as a people and as a country. From Seattle, Washington, AmeriCorps citizen and artist in service, Zoe Kane Billy. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These rights don't start out self-evident, and they are not self-enacting. It requires us to make them so. It requires us to live up every day to the American proposition. It is for us here to be dedicated to the great task before us, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. What does it mean to govern ourselves? It means to take responsibility, to take ownership, not to wait for someone else to come along and solve our problems. It means attending not only to the content of our character, but the content of our citizenship. I have a dream today. I have a dream that all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. That proposition comes not from on high down to us, it comes from within, from our hearts and our belief that we mean something when we say we are American. It comes from we, the people. And so now let us together make our voices heard. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I pledge to be an active American. I pledge to be an active American. To show up for others. To show up for others. To govern myself to help govern my community. To govern myself to help govern my community. I recommit myself to my country's creed. I recommit myself to my country's creed. To cherish liberty as a responsibility. To cherish liberty as a responsibility. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to serve and to push my country. When right to be kept right, when wrong to be set right. When right to be kept right, when wrong to be set right. Wherever my ancestors and I were born, I claim America. Wherever my ancestors and I were born, I claim America. And I pledge to live like a citizen. And I pledge to live like a citizen. Congratulations. You are all now sworn again Americans. <laughs> What are we going to do to live up to it? How will we earn that status? What does it mean? For us as Americans, we inherit a great tradition. All of us, all the people I've described today, whose stories I've told, all of you gathered here, all of us so far flung and disparate, what binds us together is nothing other than a creed. And yes, throughout this country's history, we have failed over and over and over again to live up to that creed of liberty, and equality, and opportunity. But there it stands, that creed, challenging us to do better, challenging us to earn that title citizen. And so it falls to us to make it real. To riff off the great Langston Hughes, America is ever in a state of not quite yet, and always will be, which means America is forever in the midst of redemption and in the midst of sin. Betrayals of the promise, of the creed, large and small, documented and undocumented, are all around us. And yet still, in spite of that, the arrivals continue every hour of every day. New Americans seeking to claim the title citizen, old Americans seeing their lives and their citizenship with new eyes. And the dreams the dreams continue to blossom as well. Look around you when you leave here today. We move, all of us, through an unseen matrix of American dreams. We touch chords of belief 
and belonging and truth and myth. We weave our stories together into a web of citizenship that is sometimes all contradiction and convolution, but sometimes makes the kind of sense that makes you believe this country is indeed touched by providence. So go forth, see each other, hear each other, listen to those stories, introduce yourselves to your fellow Americans. I am Eric Liu, citizen. Who are you? I want to really thank Zoe Kane Bellier, who not only performed in this piece, but as a theater artist, helped conceive of the piece and develop it. And I want to thank as well, of course, the Aspen Ideas Festival for, for giving us a chance to do this. We've done this piece in two other places in the country, in Los Angeles and in Phoenix. And part of our idea was simply this. Some of you may have seen earlier in the day, I was part of panel conversations that took a more linear, analytical approach to what citizenship is. And part of our belief, both as citizen artists and as artist citizens, is that we've got to find other angles in. We've got to find sideways angles into this topic, ways that will move the heart, ways that will awaken story. And so I do encourage all of you, not only to stick around here and share your stories with one another, but to take this idea home. And whatever form of voice you have, whatever ability you have to stitch together history and the material of everyday life all around you, go forth and spread this idea of what it means to be a citizen. Thanks very much.